Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Back at it again. Almost like we like this thing or something. This time, color commentator, one of the best in the game, host of the secret floor, Ethan Stern. How you doing, man? The game for both these teams as they try to keep their Nationals hopes alive. No doubt about that. As you mentioned earlier when we were looking at some of the stuff that's been going down with the Swiss format for the college teams, meaning that, one, they don't know their next opponent, and two, there's a certain threshold you have to pass to be able to get to the next day of play on Sunday. Both of these teams sitting at 0-2. They'll need a two-game win streak to go 2-2, two and two, which makes them eligible for a play-in game tomorrow. So somebody's hopes are getting eliminated here today. Yep, and we've got a good young team, this UC Irvine team. Uh, I saw them play their first game. I was actually refereeing that game. Uh, they make their hits. They play smart. Uh, they gave Kansas a decent run. I mean, Kansas obviously just a much more talented, experienced team. Uh, and on the other side, this LSU program, I mean, one of the most historic programs in Quidditch, one of the founding programs in the Southwest region. Um, a lot of really proud history, and they're back at the national stage, and they'd love a chance to compete for brackets by the end of today. And uh, the LSU Tigers, the Bayou Bengals, making the trip from Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge, as they like to say. Either yep. way, we know they know how to they know how to have a good time. Yep, of course. Uh, obviously, all this weather, I'm sure they had a nice wet drive over here last yeah, night. Yeah, I'm sure they were looking forward to that for sure. As you can see, the officials are at the midline here holding the balls down to make sure they don't blow either direction uh, as the wind has been pretty stout here today. Yeah, I'm sure you've talked about this plenty on this stream already, uh, but I can't stress enough the, the effect that this wind has had on this today's uh, gameplay. Uh, from top to bottom. The wind is causing balls to blow. It's taking passes and just completely taking all the speed out of them. Uh, it is the biggest factor, in my opinion, talking point of the day so far. And for LSU, Jason Wynn, a huge part of why they've been successful this season and probably why they're at Nationals because uh, other than him, the experience level is pretty minimal across the board for the Tigers. Jason Wynn playing keeper right now, interestingly enough. I don't know if this is something they designated him to do from the jump or if it's just a situational thing. Uh, Jason Wynn looks like he's about to get his first stop, and he does as he's going to come down the left-hand side over here. Beater play up front. Good throw, and let's see if he can get the finish. Jason Wynn, a beater by nature. Is going to come up with a goal here. They're going to call that no good. Looked like it was deflected in. Yeah, we had the perfect angle. That ball definitely went through the hoop. I don't know if maybe there was a beat. Uh, but, yeah, you talk about Jason Wynn, and this is a guy I believe has been with the program since they went to World Cup 3 all the way up in Middlebury. Right. Uh, the first Southwest program to ever travel to Nashville. We were wondering where he's getting all this eligibility from. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's been a lot of interesting talk about Southwest eligibility that's been cropping up. Sam Hamowitz is still playing for Texas A&M, and I feel like he's been around for an awfully long time as well. Yes, he has, no doubt about it. His experience is uh, insurmountable. I mean, near insurmountable when you're talking about having a young team out there. The guy's seen pretty much everything a college team can possibly throw at you. For sure, and yes, you love to have him in the beating game, but uh, we saw his ability to drive through, and if you don't have that at the college level, college is such a drive and just try to finish uh, kind of style. It's all about keepers. Obviously, you need some beaters, but they clearly have developed some, something in the beating game, and they're just using Jason to get that extra move in the Quaffle game. As LSU is going to get a bad throw from UC Irvine, that'll trigger their offense, and Jason Wayne can't find a lane because the only other beater for UC Irvine is ready and waiting for him to pop up there. And actually, Jason Wynn's going to track back, and LSU might have something here, their second best uh, scoring option right here, number 404, who, sad to say, next season is going to have to find a new number. USQ bringing out regulation on three-digit numbers. Only numbers from 0 to 99 are going to be eligible for jerseys next season officially. A lot of UC Irvine players are going to have to do the same thing. Yeah, as a longtime ref, I am very excited about the change. It is not easy to get a three-digit number out on a call, and half of them don't even know what their three-digit number is anyway. Yeah. Just simplify it. It's every sport, two digits is the standard. Uh, glad we're going. Especially well. real numbers. Uh, a lot of you know the intelligence level pretty high. I would say across the board when it comes to Quidditch, most of the time, uh, a lot of players elected to use unreal numbers like pi or symbols for certain other numbers and everything like that. So. Or I. That's yeah. always all kinds. That was of a real numbers. popular. <laughs> As UC Irvine here has not found their way. By the way, Ethan, that was uh, that was pretty comical that we just saw uh, an attempted throwback of a bludger 
resulted in they were trying to throw it back to the hoops and it didn't even make it halfway there actually got to about half pitch and just died so as you can tell that's a perfect example of how stout the wind is here today uh, a ball that was thrown pretty hard and pretty high elevation took it and it goes down that is uh, number four scorcher who gets beat up front and LSU may be able to bl maintain blood control but the finishing ability of their chasers is going to start to come into question here as this game it's been uh, a lot of back and forth, a lot of close opportunities that just haven't been finished. Yeah, UCI, like I said when I saw them in the first game, I was very impressed uh, that they're very stout physically, defensively, even against a really talented team like Kansas. And they're showing that here as well. They're shutting down those options even though LSU's dominating the pace of play. UC Irvine comes up with a goal here. Wait a minute. There's a whistle blown. Was he beat before on the leg? We'll find out here in a second. So the hoop is dislodged. Uh, while a hoop is dislodged, it can still be scored through as long as it hasn't has go, fully hit the ground. Yeah. Right. You have to go all. It has to. It has to completely cross the plane of the hoop for it to count as a bucket. Correct. So I think that might be what they're discussing here. I did not see a beat in the play, and I don't see a bludger anywhere on the ground. And they're gonna call the bludger loose, and pick up the small hoop. <laughs> it's gonna be a fight for it here. Jason Wynn, remember, if he gains possession of that quaffle, it is keeper ball, and everybody has to retreat back. And but it he does will. have to be solo position. He does get it there. Right. So that happened earlier uh, with, I believe it was Florida's Finest. Yeah. And um, Florida's Finest and the Lost Boys behind the hoops, there was a situation where they were trying to maintain possession, and they just needed their keeper to essentially touch it. Yep. Jason went up top, being pulled backwards by UC uh, by Ant Eater Quidditch here. UC Irvine, their official name. Yeah, it's tough to keep all the nicknames straight. Yeah, no doubt about that. B uh, bludger pressure coming after a uh, a poorly timed throw from the LSU beaters up front, and now a rundown for a ball that is now off pitch. So uh, it went off the hard boundary. Should be a turnover that goes to UC Irvine, and just like that, just running at a player with a bludger sometimes can force uh, force an, un well, it's called an unforced error. So, for a reason. it was a, That was a situation that definitely could have been escaped. And, you know, sometimes you got to work on it. Sometimes you got to come up clutch in the big moments. For instance, when somebody, when the ball is floating towards you yep. and the wind takes it, you just got to account for that sometimes. And it actually turned the ball over there, cost LSU uh, quite a bit. Yeah, the game, the way the game is played right now is really defined by the fact that you have that one reset as we see a attempted turnover here. But I think UCI is going to retain possession. And that was a really good move up front, not only to force the extra pass after getting the defensive, uh, using the defensive stoutness up front to force the UC Irvine keeper back towards the half pitch line, force that throw, and then force the through back, anticipated, tipped it down, just could not outrun the keeper who had about a two or three foot run on him. And now you see why that exchange is so important that good communication that good chemistry up front they get a goal on the board here as i believe the score is now 30 to zero yeah finally taking advantage of that size advantage nobody on lsu's whole roster is as tall as the uci keeper gomez and he just went up for that one jason wind with the shot and it's going to be called no good number four scorcher's going to come up with it here on the far right hand side a pass off the right hand side four four is going to come up with it Passed it back up top. You see, I just still tending to the shutout, and it's all been about the plays. Jason Wynn, I thought he might have been beat there. He says he dodged it. He picks up the quaffle. He and finally gets LSU on the board. And Anteater is over here trying to implore that that was not the case. But From that our view, it looked like he might have skimmed him along the inner leg. But yeah, exactly. He did He did a really nice toe touch. That's really impressive. But nonetheless, it looked like he was beat. Uh, we, of course, are not here to officiate the game we're just here to watch it sometimes exactly. yeah and uh that uh that was, a, that was a very beater dodge from jason you see that a lot from beaters the spread legs go high chasers don't really think to do that most of the time yeah it reduces your surface area significantly and, sure. and reduces the target that you can be hit with now a spin off the far perimeter side here and the ball's been jarred loose looks like lsu is forced to turn over jason win trying to take this opportunity to cut the lead down to just one goal but he's got a beater up front so he'll have to retreat backwards and hope his chasers can give him an angle takes a nice shot that accuracy once again a very beater like thing to do he went a full rotation around his shoulder and over the arm followed through on that one and jason uh is a a very strong uh, human being. We've seen. I've seen him deadlift over 300 pounds. So uh, he's got the he's got the gains. 
Yeah, and that, that was a big two possessions. Uh, he was starting to run on empty there. He said that right after them. Back-to-back -back goals turns it from a 20 nothing game, getting on the verge of out of range, to a tie game where at the face of this play, it seems like in range is the most likely situation we'll be at at the 18-minute mark. And that was interesting. I don't know what that was. Uh, number 23 just went to go tap the hoops for some reason. Maybe he was told by the officials that he had to tap back in for something. Possible. First time we're seeing number 11, our second string keeper from UCI. He impressed me in the first game. We'll see what he can do with the offense here. Let's see. Like you said, you mentioned smaller programs like UCI, LSU, uh, a shadow of their former selves in terms of sure. what they used to be able to put together on the field. Uh, talking about the days of Cole Travis and the guys before him. A near catch up there by the UCI beater. Uh, that was pr It would have been pretty impressive, but nonetheless, he gets two bludgers on the, uh, on the pitch and gets back into it and gets his team bludger control from off pitch over here. And the key, uh, secondary keeper for UCI is able to maintain possession. Are they going to call the yank, I have to wonder, as UCI is working with an advantage, so it's against LSU. Yeah, now that's there's what that no raised hand on the LSU side. The UCI trying to get an opportunity here. Driving in, slips past one defender, and was he hit on the way by? He was not. But like you said, there was a long advantage call there being held by the referees. Uh, if they decide to make the call, uh, which would most likely give the UCI keeper possession right outside the keeper zone, we'd basically be back at square one. Yeah, you mentioned this LSU program and all the things it's contributed. Brad Armenter was really the big quaffle player that came out of that program early. He was on the original Team USA, just an unstoppable force uh, coming down the lane. And Sarah Neeling, uh, all the things she's done for Quidditch, and she still she plays with the Gambits this weekend. Uh, she's Longest tenured them. player in Quidditch, exactly. Sarah Neeling. Yes. Um, she was the orchestrator of, uh, of Southwest Regionals this year, and she is – seen a lot done a lot in terms of beater play in this game and she's uh pretty darn good for sure jason Wynn, speaking captain for lsu talking to the head ref for this matchup as he goes to check the score and you mentioned cole travis obviously at the heart of the beating game for a cav team looking to make their back-to-back -back runs to national title you got to see them play qcb earlier today i know yeah i'm gonna tell you ethan um i I thought I understood Quidditch to a certain degree. And then I see guys like Calvary and QC Boston play on a regular basis. It, it, it just – and it looks like uh, the newest entry into the game, number 23 for LSU, is going to be called for a one-minute yellow card penalty. And UCI is more than likely going to score, sending him right back into the game here in a second. But uh, talking about what QC Boston and Texas Calvary put together, it is just – Amazing what the, what those two teams have done, not only with chemistry but experience, and then on top of that, the hard work they put into the gym before they ever step out onto the pitch as well. For sure, and yeah, just the strategic innovations we see from those two teams every time they come out, um, it really is a pleasure to watch. And uh, Lone Star's cooked up some really special, uh, something really special for this tournament. Wow, excellent defensive hustle from LSU, not only getting a dive on top of that loose quaffle, but on top of that getting a tackle behind the hoops. Yeah, and UCI seems to have just about every part of the game down except the finishing part. We saw a nice finish on that catch and release uh, to the keeper Gomez early in the game, but uh, we've seen a lot of times of them getting stuffed right around the hoops. And that's really the difference between a pretty uh, okay team and a really great team, the ability to push in and finish up those goals when, the no, when there's no budgers and when you're right at the hoop. And uh, Ethan, have you heard of any uh, major upsets in the college ranks? Because community's got upsets all over it in terms of the community team ranks and the upsets between uh, the higher and low seeds. Is there was a looked like there was two players that dove down for that loose quaffle. Uh, UCI trying to come up with something here. Got the quaffle for a second and a nice pass and catch right in front of the hoops. Good focus and good finish. Yeah, great catch and release there by the female chaser Asher. Uh, she was in mid stride. It's not an easy catch to make, and she had to turn her body about 90 degrees from the catch to the hoops. Uh, she did it all very smoothly. Uh, very nice goal for them. And in terms of upsets, so this is the first time slot that features teams playing their third game. This is flight A. Right. Um, and so a lot of the uh, kind of top teams haven't really seen the other top teams yet. They'll see them in rounds three and four. Um, and the Swiss format ensuring that is you play one game. Uh, everybody knew what their first game was for the college division. And based off the results of that one game, it put them 
and limited who they can play in their second. You can only play a team that has the same record as you as the game goes on, as the day goes on. Right. And uh, so, yeah, all the teams you think of, UT, Texas State, Mizzou, Kansas, Rochester, ASU, are all 2-0 to start out. Uh, ASU defeating Maryland, that was one of the big stories uh, so far today. Um, Boston University knocking off NYU. Um, and you are knocking off RPI. Uh, the four top Northeast teams actually all got paired in the second round, as it turned out. That's pretty rough. Yeah. As uh, we have a bludger turnover for UCI and Anteater Quidditch coming up here. And on top of that, the last goal will not count for UCI on that fast break. So all that effort for nothing, it'll send the beater, Kendall, for UCI, for Anteater Quidditch, into the box for one minute but it will not, blue cards uh, are infinite, so they can stack, uh, I'm sorry, they do not stack, so you can get 27 blue cards in a singular game, uh, you can only get two yellow cards in the course of one game, and there seems to be a whistle blown for some reason here. Correct, I'm not sure I've ever seen a 27 blue card game, but uh, it, it is hey, technically possible. Kendall can, he's, he's on his way. Yep, he is, he's, he's one twenty seventh of the way there. You are definitely correct. Uh, but yeah, and so this, this is a great opportunity for LSU, I always say that, uh, Beater power play should be confirmed. Uh, there is a captain's meeting going down. We're going to try to listen in. They're trying. <laughs> Okay, I think they were trying to calculate. I think they were trying to see if they could agree how much the wind affected the roll of a bludger off the pitch, which would have stopped Kendall from being put into the box, and that is not the case. Right. And yeah, that's that's another kind of issue we've been facing throughout the day. Uh, these fields are beautifully manicured. The surfaces are very smooth, as uh, and then some of the fields are also turf, which are also very smooth surfaces. You add the wind on top of it, and a soft kick in the middle of the pitch can just roll for days until it's over the hard boundary. Yeah, we saw Cito for Lost Boys actually fall into one of those situations, and he accidentally ended up guarding the bludger because he and his beater partner picked up one bludger after Cito had thrown one behind the hoops, and it kept rolling uh, almost infinitely there. And, and, Ethan, you played on so many different surfaces in your time playing Quidditch, and you know how artificial turf is when it's wet. Um, it might as well be like you're on ice. Exactly, 100%. UCI now has both beaters in the box. Uh, it's not something you see very often. It's not the second time I've seen it today. It also happened in the QC that, Cavalry. Yeah, game. I was going to say, that's the second time I've seen it today. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and uh, for LSU not to convert there, which it seems like they didn't, uh, is uh, really disappointing because there's really no answer to a team that has two bludgers to your no beaters. All you have to do is walk in and knock out all their chasers. And they're going to... Wow, you see, I just gave out that possession. Yeah, I mean, their beaters, LSU's beaters can literally be anywhere on the field they want. Uh, they, you see, I could try to pass it around a little bit, but they're really just trying to draw out some time. And this is the play that should have been made the first time. Yes, it is. And once again, another pull and a score. So to release one beater, Kendall's going to get back into this game here for a second. Let's see if he actually subs out, which is actually a lot more common than you would think after spending almost a minute in the box. You know what really happens, Ethan? I, I know I've had it happen to me, too, uh, as a player for the Houston Cosmos as a chaser, um, you'll go into the box, you'll sit down, and you'll get tired, <laughs> and you'll realize you're tired. You'll tighten up a little bit. Yeah, sure. you're just like, oh, I guess I'm winded. And when you get subbed back into the game, you have to make that sudden sprint to the hoops, and you're just like, whew, man, yeah, exactly. this is a little difficult. And you have to tag back out, and you sub out real quick. I 100% agree. And on top of that, some teams know their uh, some teams know their per player personnel too well. They know that after a penalty, they're they're not in their best headspace when they get back into the game. Right, and, and some times the rest of the lines already shifted during that penalty. So right. Shift with them. And there is a penalty coming up here after there was a tackle by the hoops by LSU. They did not get the complete takedown, but they got a throw off the far right hand side of the hoops for the goal, which would balloon the. In either lead, which they have had. We really can't jump the, goal, the gun on any goal calls in this game, though. Right. They all seem to be going backwards. It seems like it's, I mean, it seems like RP, I'm sorry, it seems like uh, in your Quidditch has led this entire game, yeah. to be honest with you. And uh, the, but despite the back to back goals from Jason Wynn when he subbed out, and he has not returned since, as he's probably getting ready to gear up to possibly play a, uh, a stint as beater. 
Yeah, and I mean, as Speeder Fight comes, as the Seeker game come, becomes closer, and it's probably going to be a snitch range game, uh, that's just kind of the situation. You want to get him in, you want to get bludger control, you want to be set for uh, what's really going to decide the game here. Yeah, exactly. That's the most important part uh, coming up. Snitch on pitch, making sure you have your best available lineup on the pitch as long as you possibly can have them. Uh, like we said, this is an elimination style game. 0 and 2 are both of these teams in the Swiss style format. That means that if one, if, I mean, you can only advance to day two if you are 2 and 2 or better than that. So 3 and 1 or 4 and 0, oh, you can only advance on to the next round of uh, um, on the next round on Sunday to possibly be in the single elimination tournament. And so far, both of these teams 0-2, another loss, and it is over. And uh, they'll be hanging out in Austin. Uh, so an LSU player has already been sent to the box. I believe he carded a UCI player as well. Uh, that card would hypothetically rule off the goal if it happened before the goal. Ooh, Ethan, he passed your test. <laughs> Ignoring a referee, I'm assuming that means uh, ignoring a referee telling you to either go back to the hoops or that you were beat and uh, not tapping back in. So when you do that, you put yourself in the position to get that penalty. And with two players in the box here, Jason Wynn may want to take his time and possibly kill the time. Uh, possibly kill the time between this one. You're listening to LSU versus Ant Eater Quidditch. Jason Wynn looks like he's about to make this run and score. This game, a lot of back and forth in this one. By the way, as the game has gone on, you can see the pace slowing down uh, even more. Not only do these younger teams need to work on getting uh, needed to work on creating their opportunities, but also they uh, need to conserve some energy. Swiss style format is exhausting, especially when you know that you have a short amount of time before you can really uh, get ready to play at the uh, get ready to play your next matchup. Yeah, and these top comp teams run four, four lines deep. A lot of these college teams right. in a big game only even want to go one or two lines deep. And, and then you're talking about knowing that you're playing some of the best teams. There's no there's no time off uh, when it comes to most of these teams. And a nice tackle on the edge over there. you got to like that uh, for number 60 for LSU. And he's going for another one. Does he get it? He does not, but he does slow him down enough to get that beat. Sometimes that's just as good. Good defensive there. I haven't seen him much on the offensive end, but a big stop there for sure. As a guy who's played against LSU uh, at Wolfpack myself and seen them at regionals, have not seen 60 this entire season. Yeah, and sometimes that's what you get from uh, teams right around nationals. The, the kind of the hidden gems come out of the woodwork that you never saw for any of the small Right, tournaments. like Sam Houston State University. Their leading scorer was essentially out for the past uh, month and a half of play in, Southwest uh, in the Southwest region, and most people did not get a chance to see him on film, so they'll get a chance to see him in person. I know Sam Houston's already got one win under their belt. They beat James Madison earlier today. Uh, so the... One of those two tackles was apparently uh, illegal. Uh, I'm not trying to hear exactly the call, but uh, 60 will be joining us over here. And five five penalties so far? Uh, that might be an understatement. Oh. Two, so we had Kendall. We had both of UCI's beaters in there. Right. Uh, we had two female chasers in, Correct. and now we got 60 in, so five in total. Were, no, I, were, there, were there none called before that? The... I want, uh, maybe there were cards waved off because of goals being scored. So. UCI uses its reset. Uh, they didn't want to, but uh, she stepped a little bit too far back there. With uh, bludgeon control coming up here, we'll see if UCI can generate some offense as they're playing a high defense up top. Uh, number four almost finished the tackle there, and a nice shot attempt, and there was some hesitation by the goal ref who changed his call from good to no good after he saw the uh, AR over here hesitate as well. And that's the small differences that uh, define a great team or a good team at UCI had their beaters go in, but their quaffle play wasn't ready to come in right behind them. The beaters had already backed off from their attack by the time the quaffle players were driving. And it created a gap exactly. between the beaters and uh, it created a gap between the beaters and the chase and the chasers up top, and they weren't even past the initial line of defense from the LSU Tigers. And now it's the, always the biggest struggle as we got a player down in front of the LSU bench over here. Yeah. Uh, but Ethan and 
Heath and a lot of uh, a lot of hype around a good chunk of college teams in the community uh, community ranks so far. The Nomads not living up to the hype. The one seed out of their pool and they lose their first two games of pool play today. Yeah, I mean, the one game against the Gambits they played before we knew it was going to be a snitch range, really close back and forth affair, and that is what it was. They ended up losing 1-3, uh, 1-10. But Baton Rouge, um, not much of uh, not much to write home about. I mean, you, you're obviously from the Southwest region. You've seen them a good amount, but this is not a team people are expecting to make big waves and to take down a real power like the Nomads. Uh, quite the statement win. Yeah, uh, and Bark UC, no surprise there how they won it. It really came down to the beater battle up front. They call Jason Wynn for contact for behind, and he'll be headed uh, to the box. Yep, so that uh, puts LSU two qualified players down. UCI should have as many open passing options as they could ever want. And uh, Arroyo Long, you see him number 57 here. He's actually... Uh, <laughs> oh, Jason Wynn uh, heckling us a little bit. Hey, we'll be doing the heckling around here. Uh, as Arroyo Long, I was mentioning... <laughs> As Arroyo Long, a key, uh, key thing to mention, we talk about uh, media and getting the exposure for Quidditch. Arroyo's working on, has been working on a film called The 131st that tells the Quidditch of, uh, tells the, tells the tale of Andy to Quidditch's path to nationals. The 131st symbolizing the ranking that they started at at one point during the year and the entire series follows their path to being within the top 88 to get to nationals. So, uh, pretty cool on his part. Got a chance to look at the trailer. It's pretty funny. For sure, and especially if they could get a win here, that would be a really nice little capper in the <laughs> climax section of the, of the movie. Exactly, and uh, even some of the greatest Quidditch documentaries don't end the way that they're supposed to. Of course. Fly, Mudbloods, Mudbloods ends with UCLA losing uh, to Middlebury. Yep. By the way, Ethan, when you heard that Middlebury, by the way, how many how many rumors had you heard that Middlebury was getting a team back before they actually got a team back? Um, I mean, so we uh, up in Boston, the Boston Knight Riders, the MLQ team, uh, had start had started having Ian Skira play for them a year ago. So that's kind of when things we knew things were starting to stir because he was a really talented, athletic player. Uh, and then a year later, they contacted Massachusetts Quidditch Conference about wanting to come on um, as a member team and. Uh, they've they have to trek a lot farther than everybody else in the conference, but uh, they do it on a semi-regular basis, and uh, they're a good team. Uh, they've got a lot of spirit, uh, and it's just so great to see. Just in the same way, it's great to see LSU back in nationals. It's great to see Middlebury back in the college fold. And, and Middlebury, for those of you who are not up on your college history or just like to hear it, uh, Middlebury won the first five. Uh, first five IQA championships in America, uh, essentially, and they got this sport started all those years ago in, what, 2005? Uh, it sounds about right. This is our 11th World Cup. We probably added a year on top of that, uh, so it's probably right about where we are. And, and yet, to this day, uh, it's only one other college has won a Nationals, uh, that being UT, uh, who won three times. And uh, one of those dynamic runs there and. And it, it actually, if you think about it, I'm sure it foreshadows very well. Three national championships, and then all of a sudden, you know, all those years later, Nationals is here in Round Rock, right in the backyard of Austin, Texas, uh, one of the most popular venues for college, uh, sorry, for Quidditch to be UT, a very talented team, Texas State and San Marcos down the street, uh, Texas Calvary and Lone Star, all, all housed within the short amount of space that is Austin, Texas. Yeah, when we get into the late rounds of the college and even the club uh, bracket rounds and all the support kind of starts kind of centering on these featured pitches, I think there's going to be a fever uh, for those Southwest teams. No doubt about it. That battle between QC Boston and Texas Calvary drew a massive crowd. Most of that, most of those bleachers on the opposite side of the field were completely full. Yes. And uh, no, no doubt about it, definitely quite the entertaining matchup. That snitch Rob. He's ready to go to work again here. Uh, yeah, I've, I've gotten, had a chance to uh, watch Rob Snitch a few times today. Uh, he's been uh, not as much in the sport as he was a few years ago. Took right. some time off. Uh, I assume he's here because he's from the Texas area and Nationals in Texas. Uh, he hasn't lost a step. Every performance I've seen from him today has been exceptional. No doubt about that as he uh, has basically been caught off of the um, – the only time I think the only time he's been caught is basically in a in a solo situation, and the seeker has had to dive or do some crazy type of dive. I know one uh, came over 
and almost jumped over his right shoulder, and he slid out of the way, and as he was falling, they pulled the snitch. But UCI scores that goal right there, and uh, the Seekers are ready to roll here for LSU. But like you said, Rob's been doing a pretty good job here today. Yeah, he uh, made the Lone Star Seekers look bad for a very long time in their game. They had a lot of time alone with him. They were up out of range against RU, and it took them still probably 10 minutes of time just all alone with him to make the catch. And that's that's saying something. T.J. Goley, a guy who uh, trying to make his – way to possibly being on Team USA for Redeem Team 2018. So looking for great performances. By the way, Ethan, you got any uh, – you scouting anybody for Team USA or anything like that? You helping out with the process, or are you just in, uh, just waiting to see what the roster is? Uh, I'm just uh, waiting around. I uh, think that Michael Prada is uh, the right guy for the job. I think he's going to do a great job selecting this team. Um, and, I mean, I'm happy to help out however I can, but uh, – uh, it's Yada's team, and I think he's going to do good things with it. Gotcha. By the way, where does he get the nickname from? Like, where does that where does that stem from? Uh, Just rhymes? Yeah, I mean, his last name is Prada. Uh, so, Yada, he's been Yada as long as I've known him. We were talking, he, the World Cup 5 was his first World Cup, uh, and he's always been Yada uh, since his Penn State days. He was a Penn State Nittany Lion. Oh, man, they are in attendance here today, so I'm sure he's very happy to see that. Yep. yep. Earn their spot here. As uh, you see Irvine, you talk about what they've done uh, here today. They've been the more dominant team, and it definitely just missed that one off the base of the hoop. That's a rough shot to take as uh, LSU has been really, and, and, and Ethan, we see this in sports all the time, man. The game dominated by one team or the game controlled by one team, and then all of a sudden the team that's been down the entire game flips it on its head and takes home the win. Yeah, that play was the perfect kind of microcosm of everything you were just saying because he just flew through their entire team and just couldn't finish, and that just keeps it close. It's no different than any other failed scoring attempt. And uh, the beater play has been very active here today between the two teams. In particular, it seems like the Anteaters have been more on the giving end of the beats than receiving for sure. Kendall uh, back over here. Arroyo Long has a good amount of experience as well, and he's been in and out of this game pretty consistently as we're about to get the snitch play in. The reason Ethan and I have been so calm is because this game is very obviously going to be determined by a snitch pull. Yeah, uh, neither team has been, as again, UCI fails to finish. I mean, UCI has left at least 50 or 60 points on the table uh, and, right next to the hoops. And when you go back and you look at the film to, uh, tonight in the hotel room, they're going to see the opportunities that they missed out on. Yep. And, and hopefully that, hopefully, it's, hopefully it's not them talking about being eliminated from nationals. Exactly. So. As uh, now we got snitch on pitch play. Let's see what UCI decides to do. And there's a grab from Arroyo. Oh, no, that's not Arroyo. That's a grab from UCI. So, Rob Snitch, as we talked about today, uh, he lost track of the UCI seeker on that play. Yeah, he did. And it was uh, the, the uniform effect. He didn't see him coming. He had just tagged back into the game and came up from behind him and grabbed it as he was dealing with one of the other Seekers. So that's always difficult, especially when the Seekers are coming from opposite directions and intentionally trying to hide that grab was good. And just like that, ladies and gentlemen, the LSU Tigers are eliminated from U.S. Quidditch Cup 11. They will be playing for the rest of the day, but they will not be advancing on the day two, the UCI Anteaters. Yeah. Still hope a lot. Yeah, uh, we talk about uh, when it comes to the uh, Seeker's getting beat out of plays, and it's the same way a quarterback has to have a clock about uh, a rusher coming on his blind side. Right. Uh, a snitch has to have a clock, and obviously Rob's a great snitch, but a little rusty, just let one get away there. Hey, no doubt about that, and I'm sure uh, everybody is happy that this one is over quickly. These two teams, have uh, they were running all over the pitch. I know there wasn't a ton of scoring in the course of this game, but they were, uh, they were gassing themselves, that was for sure, especially with uh, LSU having the short lines up front, and uh, same thing for... UCI, they get they, they get a win here. They are now one and two in Swiss play, and they will move on to the next round, get another opponent. LSU will get a chance to get one more game in here today, and then they'll be done uh, for they'll be done for the rest of Swiss play. Thanks for joining us, Ethan. Really fun talking to you, yeah, man. Yeah, glad to be here. No doubt about it, man. Where are you going next? I uh, head over to Pitch Five to do the Eighth Man stream, which you can find on the Eighth Man Facebook page. There you go. Shameless plug. Hashtag shameless plug. I'm kidding. Uh, anyway, we are done here today, ladies and gentlemen. UCI and Eaters victorious over the LSU Tigers.